Egypt, a land of hidden treasures, buried secrets, and centuries-old mysteries left unsolved. The reign of its last queen, Cleopatra, brought chaos and disaster. She saw 3,000 years of civilization end, but her story's been buried in myth, and almost every trace of her has been lost or destroyed. Can today's experts piece together the true story of Egypt's last pharaoh, Cleopatra? Most people know the name Cleopatra. She's remembered as a legendary temptress and for the men she seduced. The true story of Egypt's last queen has been obscured by soap opera and scandal. The life of Cleopatra is a mystery, but she was a magical queen. Her beauty captured the hearts of the most two powerful people on earth. She was in charge when the great civilization of ancient Egypt finally fell. And the version we have of Cleopatra's story was written by the men who defeated her, the Romans. The Romans put the spin on the Cleopatra tale. Um, they turned her into a salacious harlot, this bubble-headed sex kitten who's jumping in and out of bed with any available Roman. But there was more to her than that. This was a woman who came to power at 18 and kept the Romans at bay for over 20 years. The more historians discover about her, the more she appears as an extraordinary woman of her times, one who made no distinction between private and political life. The choices she made helped shape world history. And yet physical evidence of her reign is hard to find. Even though Cleopatra is so famous, most of what we know about her is hearsay or myth. It's important to look for Egyptian evidence of Cleopatra because she's the ruler of Egypt. It's her home and it's her country. If we find Egyptian evidence, then we'll have the Egyptians' own perspective on Cleopatra's reign, not the Romans. Cleopatra was born into a unique period in Egyptian history, one where two cultures had fused to produce an entirely new society. While she may be remembered as an Egyptian, she was actually the product of a Greek dynasty who'd arrived in Egypt some 300 years before. These people were basically Greeks from northern Greece in Macedonia, what we call it today. The dynasty was founded by Ptolemy, one of Alexander the Great's generals who followed him across Asia. He essentially took control of Egypt and founded his own dynasty here. Essentially, the Ptolemies were Greek and Egyptian. The Egyptians had been building their own unmistakable monuments for two and a half thousand years, but the Ptolemies still left their mark. Egypt's cities are full of ruined Greek-style buildings. Even here at Saqqara, the pharaoh's ancient burial ground, there are statues of great Greek thinkers, Homer, Plato and others. After several unremarkable Ptolemaic rulers, the last real ruler of the Ptolemaic period of Egypt was Cleopatra. She ended that Hellenistic period, begun by Alexander several hundred years previously. But the Ptolemies didn't trample on Egyptian tradition. They went to great lengths to show that they respected it. They adopted local customs, depicting themselves in Egyptian dress and building new temples to Egyptian gods. Evidence of this fusion of cultures still survives across Egypt, but one of the best examples lies hidden beneath the streets of modern Alexandria. Colin Clement is visiting the tombs of Komal Shafka in the southwest of the city. This is a guardian of the tomb, head of Anubis. Now, Anubis represents the ancient Egyptian religion. He was the, the, the god of you know, the afterworld. And then down here, rather than legs, we have the tail of the Agatha demon snake, a beneficial god of the Hellenistic period. This is a perfect example of, of, of the, the mix that Alexandria had become. And this is the world into which Cleopatra was born. 
These two great cultures, fusing here, dominated the ancient world, defining the way people thought, lived and built. It is rather clumsily done, it's a mishmash. But nonetheless, it is very, very striking. In Ptolemaic Egypt, the mixing of Greeks and Egyptians resulted in a melting pot, and Alexandria was typical of that, so that people understood Greek and Egyptian language, and they started to make um, architecture and art that used some Greek forms, but also some Egyptian elements. The same mix would have played a part in the way Cleopatra was brought up. She had an Egyptian's belief in the absolute power of the pharaoh, and a Greek's reverence for knowledge and learning. She could be regarded as the ultimate educated woman. She was clearly a woman of stature, of great intellect and multilingual skills. Contemporary experts believe that Cleopatra's education prepared her for victory in the wider world. She was taught to speak nine or ten languages. Her knowledge as a queen through Egypt came because she lived in the most cultured, wonderful city in the world in that time. We could consider her the epitome of learning and aristocratic bearing, perhaps linked to the idea of Alexandria as the centre of learning in the ancient world, uh, focused on the famous Alexandria Library. Alexandria's library was at the heart of Cleopatra's world. Today, the place where it once stood is occupied by a modern library, built as a monument to the ancient building. Centuries before the coming of the printing press, it's said to have held over 700,000 scrolls. Generations of Cleopatra's ancestors were ruthless in their ambition to make this city an international centre of learning and ideas. The Ptolemies went aggressively to try to get a copy of every single book that was in existence. Um, and they even had customs agents search vessels that pulled into the port. And if they found a book on board that was not in the library, the book was confiscated and brought to the library. It represents the world's first think tank. And the Ptolemies, Cleopatra included, were in a position to pay scholars simply to think and use their brains. She encouraged research and scholarship on a purely academic, intellectual, idealistic level. But there's another building which reveals how Cleopatra's dynasty wanted to be seen. A structure that represented their public face. It was literally the first thing that anyone arriving at the port of Alexandria would see. The Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There are written texts from antiquity which tell us of this large tower built of white stone standing on the tip of the Isle of Pharos. So we have images, but none are hugely detailed. These texts describe an impossibly high monument commissioned by Cleopatra's forefather, Ptolemy, as a beacon by which ships could navigate. But it's another part of Cleopatra's story where myth obscures the facts. The breakthrough in the recent years is our discovery of elements of the monumental doorway to it. We found both door jams and the lintel. Jean-Yves Empereur led the team which, in 1994, uncovered these massive pieces of stone lying on the seabed. He believes they once formed the doorway of the Pharos. These are two fragments of the colossal gate of the lighthouse. And it was broken uh, with an earthquake. And so we could uh, pick them out from the seawater. But still there, uh, there is the other one, the twin one, and also the lintel. And so we have the concrete frame and with the base, it's more than 11 meters, 45 centimeters high. The stones reveal that the pharos was another combination of Egyptian and Greek elements. You know, this stone speaks by itself. It's granite from a swamp, so it means that it was carved by Egyptian craftsmen. But it was used in uh, this Greek construction of the lighthouse, the symbol of Alexandria. The doorway was made from three solid blocks of granite, each weighing more than a hundred tons. 
it stood almost 38 feet high. Clearly, any building whose doorway had these monumental proportions must have been big. A major clue to what the whole building looked like lies 30 miles along the coast. Cleopatra researcher Andrea Kay is visiting what some believe to be a copy of the Pharos. Only this is a scaled-down version. We are at the lighthouse at Taposiris Magna. In Ptolemaic times, this is a very large settlement. And this lighthouse is built on a Ptolemaic cemetery. Um, it probably served as a burial monument of some kind and possibly a signal tower. The Pharos was at least four times the height of this tower, but Andrea Kay believes its shape and proportions are the same. It's got a large square base with an octagonal middle section and a cylindrical top. This exactly matches ancient descriptions of the Pharos. Using the design of this lighthouse and the scale dictated by the doorway found in the harbor, it's possible to create a picture of how the landmark of the gateway to Cleopatra's empire might have looked. Standing almost 400 feet high, this was among the tallest buildings on Earth right up until its destruction in the 14th century. If the builder's intention was to win prestige, it worked. The Pharaoh's Lighthouse was a feat of engineering that welcomed any visitor into the harbour at Alexandria, but it also showed the world that Alexandria was the centre of power in the Mediterranean. The Ptolemies had a word for it, trephi, sometimes translated into English as luxury, and trephi means everything in excess, philanthropic endeavours, building endeavours. So whatever it is that you're doing, go over the top when you're doing it. And you could go over the top because you had unlimited resources at your disposal. This would have been Cleopatra's inheritance, boundless self-belief, and the freedom to rule. But the city that Egyptologists are trying to rediscover was under threat. Cleopatra's ancient empire was about to sink from view. Cleopatra, the last queen of Egypt, was the product of a unique culture and of extraordinary times. To truly understand her, today's archaeologists are delving into the world which she came from and which she left irrevocably changed. That means looking at Alexandria, the city where events which would alter the course of history were played out. in the 2,000 years since a Roman army seized Cleopatra's empire, the cities moved on. Alexandria is now a sprawling modern metropolis, painting a picture of the city that Cleopatra knew involves a lot of detective work. Egyptologist Andrea Kay is using a GPS system to map the exact locations of the few landmarks which survive from antiquity. We're trying to get a better idea about the layout of the ancient city of Alexandria by mapping it on a computer. She's collating information gleaned from ancient accounts and from the maps that predate the city's modern development. It enables her to identify where key buildings once stood. It gives you a better idea of what was there. And by piecing it all together, we can try to complete that picture as best we can to, to try and understand the kind of city that Cleopatra lived in. In 2,000 years, the very shape of the landscape has changed. Since Cleopatra's time, there's been a lot of erosion and subsidence of the land. And over the centuries, the old city has been built upon time and time again. Any undiscovered ancient remains lie a long way below street level. For scholars hunting evidence of Cleopatra and the world she knew, the focus of interest has to be on what was the heart of her city, the palace district. This would have been a very important part of the city that Cleopatra lived in. She would have lived right over there. Would have been one of the most opulent portions of the city and the palace district taking up a whole fifth of the area inside the city walls. 
This is one part of the city where we know Cleopatra lived. But archaeologists have always assumed that it was lost forever. The sea levels have changed so much that part of the city, the part that bordered the harbour, is now underwater. It's in a, an unfortunate location in terms of earthquake um, and seismic action. So it had suffered from earthquakes and even a report of a tsunami, a kind of tidal wave, in the 4th century AD. But one man was convinced there were still clues out there waiting to be found. In the early 1990s, marine archaeologist Frank Godio began diving in the harbour. He was looking for fragments. What he found was a sunken city. He and his team have begun to exhibit some of the many items they brought to the surface. Evidence of a uniquely rich culture. First, we dove to see if something could be seen. And you could see only sediment. Nothing. Everything was buried under the sediment, underwater. Then we had to start doing underwater excavation, and little by little we saw red granite. And it was a block of red granite. And cleaning it, I saw hieroglyph. And this was the first artifact we found in Alexandria Great Arbor. We found thousands and thousands of artifacts, beautiful sculptures. It's a kind of a vision from the past and of everything which was there in the past. There were ruined buildings, as well as statues honoring various gods and pharaohs. Each object added to an emerging picture of ancient Alexandria. And finally, a breakthrough, a find they could tie directly to Cleopatra. We found sometimes artifacts related to her. We found, for example, the likeness of the father of Cleopatra. Did she commission this statue or witness its construction? Another bust has an even stronger personal connection. We found also a, a, a beautiful head of black granite and it has been uh, identified as Caesarion, the son of Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. This is a bust of Cleopatra's son, Caesarion, fathered by Julius Caesar, then murdered by his successor. It's thought to have stood alongside a statue of Cleopatra herself. It identifies the harbour site where it was found as the location of the Ptolemy's palace. Together, the finds from the underwater excavations provide a tangible link to a time that has passed into legend. They bring us face to face with the city of the real Cleopatra. In the mind of everybody, there is a, a merge between Cleopatra and Alexandria. It's a kind of synonym. And Alexandria had a very important uh, role in the development of, of the Western world and in passing the messages of the antiquity to the new Western world. The effects of what unfolded here during Cleopatra's reign would be felt around the world. But in those dying days of the Egyptian empire, Alexandria shone as the greatest city on earth. The Alexandria of Cleopatra was the be all and end all. Uh, some people say it's the New York of the times, the Paris, of the, you pick the capital. It was the place to be. So what you're looking at is this glistening marble metropolis and Rome living in wooden hovels, a hick town, as opposed to the hip jet set place to be. And it was this very prosperity which put not only Alexandria, but the whole of Egypt at risk of invasion. The problem for Cleopatra and the people of Egypt was that they were victims of their own success. Egypt had an apparently inexhaustible source of wealth, bound to make other powers envious. For 3,000 years, the River Nile had nourished Egyptian civilization. 
Its annual flood brought millions of tons of fertile soil, saturating the plains and creating rich farmlands. Egypt grew grain. The economy grew fat. The agricultural potential of the country, the ability of its grain resources to feed Rome and the Roman Empire, this is really what set Rome on the course for collision with Cleopatra. After Cleopatra's death, her country would become Rome's breadbasket, supplying a third of its grain. Now in Alexandria, beneath the city streets, experts have found eyewitness evidence of the chain of events which destroyed both the queen and her empire. Cleopatra didn't know that she would be the last of the Ptolemies, a dynasty that had ruled in Egypt for 300 years. She'd grown up with a sense of her family's superiority, their greatness, their right to rule. She took the throne aged 18. How does uh, uh, unbridled wealth and absolute advantage affect anyone? She can be a dominant force, a mistress, if you will, of a nation that spans uh, from Alexandria maybe as far as Rome. But she immediately faced a crisis that had long been brewing. The Ptolemies basically sucked Egypt dry. Their total incompetence as rulers, their failure in the military field, their inability to control their courtiers and the priesthood, and their real self-indulgence had basically sunk the dynasty to the lowest depths it had ever been. This was what Cleopatra inherited, an empire on a collision course with disaster. Her reign began with a power struggle. Her brother seized the throne, and the displaced queen was forced into hiding. At the Anfushi tombs, hidden beneath the modern city, Jean-Yves Empereur finds contemporary evidence of what happened next. First of all, it's very surprising to find here such uh, fragile uh, drawings made by simple uh, charcoal. These crude charcoal drawings depict a single event which was to change Cleopatra's entire world. Seeing an opportunity to gain power in a weakened Egypt, Rome sent a fleet of ships to Alexandria. At its head was Julius Caesar. His troops and the crew of his fleet uh, escaped from the battle and stayed in this kind of shelter. These graffiti are a 2,000-year-old record of one of the most notorious meetings in ancient history. Caesar's arrival and intervention on Cleopatra's behalf allowed her to take back the throne. He was clearly charmed by her, and once he'd removed her younger brother, they began an affair. For Cleopatra's part, the arrival of the Romans didn't mean the handover of power, so much as an opportunity to return Egypt to greatness. The meeting is usually portrayed as a seduction, but it had vast political significance. Rome was probably going to be her worst enemy or her best ally. And so when Cleopatra and Caesar actually met, they both were on the same page with regard to what they wanted. Uh, they wanted world domination, and they realized that united, they would be able to realize that dream as opposed to being enemies and having to fight each other. In this version of events, Cleopatra wasn't Caesar's mistress, but his partner. She wasn't surrendering so much as forging an alliance. They had a son, and though he bore his father's name, Caesarian, Cleopatra went to great pains to show he had, through her, the blood of a true pharaoh. Bob Bianchi is examining the evidence of this 500 miles south of Alexandria on the of Dendera. The Egyptian evidence does not give us a personal picture of the queen. We do not have hieroglyphs that tell us that she... What we do have from the Egyptian evidence is how she is portrayed as a monarch that represents Cleopatra at the height of her power. This is probably the image of Cleopatra uh, anywhere in Egypt, anywhere in the world. Cleopatra, as the mother of believes, is there. These figures, 20 feet high, convey a message. He may have had a Roman father, but Caesarian was an Egyptian. He was, first and foremost, his mother's heir. 
Here, Cleopatra was telling the world how she and Egypt had harnessed Rome's power. She used religion to help make her point, appropriating one of the most important Egyptian festivals. She portrayed herself as the goddess Hathor and Caesar as the falcon god Horus. These representations of the two were united in a ceremony that took place along a 90-mile stretch of the Nile. It revolves around a procession of sacred boats, one stationed here in Dendera. The Dendera boat carries the female goddesses, the boat from Edfu carries the male god Horus. The male boat would depart for Dendera from the temple at Edfu. These two temples are a mirror of each other. They're essentially joined. Andrea Kay explores the Edfu temple. Its construction was only finished during Cleopatra's reign. Cleopatra made very clear that she was the goddess Hathor. And it was also very widely implied that Caesar was the King Horus. So the statue of the god Horus, representing Caesar in this case, would have been placed in the bark, which is essentially a mobile shrine, carried among the people to the river and transported to Dendera, where Hathor, also Cleopatra, had the female portion this was a piece of propaganda as much as a religious ritual. When Caesar and Cleopatra came together, she didn't become Roman. Rather, Caesar took on an Egyptian identity. The fact that he was portrayed as Horus, the pharaoh's own god who united and protected Egypt, is highly significant. This is Caesarian, Cleopatra's son by Julius Caesar. And he's being shown here as protected by the god Horus, whose temple this is. We see in Dendera how Cleopatra shows herself as Hathor. We see here how Horus may represent Caesar. And now we have Caesarian, who is the divine child of the two gods. It was Cleopatra who created this statue. And it's possible to deduce what she was thinking. She was literally placing her son under the protection of Caesar perhaps because she knew that Roman domination of the ancient world was, in the end, inevitable. The woman who commissioned these monuments is a far more complicated character than the seductress of legend. This is Cleopatra as politician, propagandist and leader. A position of weakness may have forced her into alliance with Rome, but she used it, taking what she wanted from it and selling it back to the people of Egypt as a victory. Cleopatra clearly wanted to portray herself as a great pharaoh. But this leaves Egyptologists with a puzzle. Robert Bianchi is near Luxor, site of one of the ancient world's largest religious complexes, Karnak. The pharaohs were building monuments here for 2,000 years before Cleopatra. And every major pharaoh of Egypt Tutankhamun, Ramses, Amenhotep, all left their name here, including the Ptolemies. So we've got almost a 2,000 year span of history here. It was almost obligatory for a pharaoh to build a monument here and leave his mark. So where is Cleopatra's? We would expect that a strong nationalistic queen like Cleopatra herself would have done something to leave her mark here. It seems unlikely she simply neglected to do what others had done. Perhaps Cleopatra did leave something here, but the people who came after her sought to obliterate any trace of her. Bob Bianchi is convinced by the circumstantial evidence that Cleopatra did build at Karnak. We know, for example, that in the second century AD, during the reign of the Roman Emperor Hadrian, a very, very important priestly family living in this area had their female members named Cleopatra. So her memory existed, and that living memory strongly suggests that there must have been monuments here that would have reinforced their naming of the children after this great queen. 
It may have been torn down deliberately. It may have lain forgotten in this 100-acre site. But finding what Cleopatra left here has become a mission for some archaeologists, part of restoring her reputation. They're rediscovering a story that's been buried or hidden or mistold for 2,000 years. Now a new find from a section of the site known as the Avenue of Sphinxes suggests the search is over. Thousands of statues once lined the route between Karnak and the temple at Luxor. Each one bears the head of a pharaoh and the body of a lion. It was long thought these statues predated Cleopatra by some 300 years. But new thinking suggests this may not be the case. We just uh, found uh, a new head for one of the sphinxes which were here. It seems that this head uh, was made during the Ptolemaic period. Judging by the style of the statue and the face it represents, Mansour Barek believes it comes from much closer to Cleopatra's time. The eyes are bigger, the eyebrows are longer, so I'm sure that the Ptolemies added sphinxes on this ceremonial uh, route. It's one of a number of similar statues, all found close together. Their presence convinced Barak and his team that they should focus their search here. Eventually, he made the discovery that generations of archaeologists have searched for. An oblong carving containing the name Cleopatra, the sacred cartouche of the great queen. Here we have a nice evidence about uh, Cleopatra. Uh, a block of sandstone. So, you can see the cartouche of Cleopatra, you can see here, flanked with the cobra. This is an evidence of uh, the history of Cleopatra lost world. This is, you know, a piece shows us that Cleopatra did something here. For Egyptologists, this block is a tremendous discovery. It brings us within touching distance of Cleopatra's world. But it's also a reminder of how little physical evidence there is. Ramesses the Great left his name across Egypt and built an empire in stone. Khufu built the Great Pyramid, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Typically, a pharaoh filled his capital with statues of himself. But not Cleopatra. There are no grand statues of her in Alexandria. To find a likeness of the queen in this city, it's necessary to look at something rather more humble, coins. Colin Clement has come to this warehouse to see the relics of a lost financial empire. marvelous to find coins in such good condition and to find actual coins of Cleopatra, who is, of course, extremely famous, but ultimately not very well known in terms of physical archaeological corroboration. Uh, I mean, her, her renown is worldwide, but within the city that she ruled, there's very, very few signs of her presence. The fact that they survive today is extraordinary, but the coins were also remarkable in their own time. We have the, the profile of, of Cleopatra herself. I mean, she's not strikingly beautiful, despite all the, the myths and legends that go along with her. You know, it's, it is clearly her. What does it tell us about it? Well, in terms of Egyptian or Ptolemaic coinage, you don't get female representation, except alongside the ruling king. Here we have the head of the sovereign. So you know that Cleopatra was in charge of the country. She was the ruler. In their 3,000-year history, there were only five occasions when the ancient Egyptian people were ruled by a female pharaoh alone. Cleopatra's reign was one of them. But Bob Bianchi believes these coins weren't intended for the Egyptian people. The ancient Egyptians did not use coins. They used barter. The coins that Cleopatra mints were meant to pay the Greek people in her employ. So the coins become currency for propaganda rather than identifications. This is what the queen looks like. So the face on these coins was meant to be seen by people outside her empire. Not Cleopatra as she looked in life, but rather Cleopatra as she wanted to be seen. 
not the victim of spin that she would later become, but the master of it. On the coin, she portrays herself as a classical Greek, calling to mind her ancestral connection to Alexander the Great. But on the temple walls at Dendera, she is pure Egyptian, the living embodiment of the goddess Isis. So how did Cleopatra see herself? Though the Ptolemies and their royal court remained proud of their Greek heritage, it's said Cleopatra was the first to learn the language of her Egyptian subjects, research now suggests that the bloodline was less pure. She probably wasn't just completely European. Um, you've got to remember that her family had actually lived in Egypt for almost 300 years at the time when she came to power. Sally Ann Ashton has spent years studying artifacts to find what she believes is the truest physical likeness of Cleopatra. Her ancestry was complex, so she presented herself in different ways to different people. The reason I chose this particular ring was because it's Egyptian, it shows Cleopatra as Isis, and it shows a very young Cleopatra, and I think given that she was only 40 when she died, um, this is the kind of image that we need to be looking at. The image on this ring is important. It was made and displayed in Cleopatra's time. Converted into a 3D model, it may be as close as we're able to get to seeing the face of one of history's most powerful women. In the past, whenever Cleopatra's story's been told, her looks, her supposed legendary beauty, have played an important part. But it's clear this is a caricature. This is the woman who met Julius Caesar, a conqueror, a dictator, and forged an alliance. Julius Caesar and Cleopatra knew what each other wanted. They were mental equals, political equals, and they were both as cunning and conniving as you could possibly be. Caesar and Cleopatra's alliance lasted four years. It appears to have worked so well for her that it caused jealousy and concern in Rome. The senators were very disturbed by Caesar's relationship with Cleopatra. And it was probably because of the situation that they eventually did decide to murder him. The assassins who stabbed Caesar in 44 BC thought they were striking a blow for Rome. But they also dealt a mortal wound to any hope that the two empires could coexist. Rome would soon be torn by civil war. The prize for the winner was Egypt. When Julius Caesar was assassinated, Cleopatra lost her lover, the father of her child, and an ally who'd been the most powerful man on earth. It's believed she made a public display of her grief by building him a great monument known as the Caesareum in the center of Alexandria. Today, the site where the Caesareum stood is boxed in by modern buildings. Recent excavations have found evidence of a Roman-style construction. Here we're looking at a statue of Roman Emperor Septimus Severus, which we found on our dig on the site of the Caesareum. Begun at the time of Cleopatra, um, but ultimately taken on as a site uh, dedicated to the cult of the emperor, the cult of the Roman Caesar. The building had a life after Cleopatra's death. When the Romans had finally installed themselves in Egypt and their emperors came to be worshipped as gods, the Caesarium became a cult temple. Originally constructed as an Egyptian monument to a mourned friend of Egypt, it was enlarged and extended, a reminder in stone of Rome's dominant presence and power. There are descriptions by Philo of Alexandria. He certainly says that it was splendid, it was rich, it was adorned with many statues. The overall impression of it is being a rich, rich cult site, which would figure if it's dedicated to the emperor. But by the time that account was written, whatever structure Cleopatra had built was probably long gone, swept away by the Roman forces, which some experts say tried to erase her from history. Because Cleopatra was there, when Rome nearly tore itself apart. After Caesar's death, she began a relationship with Mark Antony. Mark Antony was a Roman general, and he was sort of the right-hand man of Julius Caesar. And after Caesar's death, Mark Antony was sharing power with Octavian. They were sharing the rule of Rome, 
and Mark Anthony was given the eastern part. So because of that, he came to Egypt and he met Cleopatra and, of course, began a relationship with her. The relationship between Mark Antony and Cleopatra produced three children. It's remembered as a doomed romance, but it may also have been another smart move on Cleopatra's part. With Julius Caesar out of the picture, Cleopatra still needed an ally in Rome. Securing Mark Antony's support was another canny move on Cleopatra's part, helping her to protect Egypt's interests. Cleopatra needed a strong, powerful ally to replace Julius Caesar, and the only candidate that was viable was Mark Antony, and the two of them ultimately forged an alliance uh, where they thought that they would um, pull their resources together, uh, fight against Octavian, and um, the winner would take everything. Roman historians recorded how, in a ceremony called the Donations of Alexandria, Antony and Cleopatra divided up their empire and made their children heads of state. Cleopatra was to rule Egypt with Caesarean, while the rest of the lands were divided between the three children she'd had with Mark Antony. But the idea he was giving territories away made him new enemies at home. The reason it fell badly on Roman sensibilities were that these territories were not Antony's to give. With strength and support, Mark Antony's rival, Octavian, saw an opportunity for final victory. Mark Antony and Cleopatra went into a naval battle with Octavian, and they were defeated, and there was no coming back from it. And they both knew it, and they both sank into despair when they returned to Egypt, just waiting for Octavian to come back and take control of the country. Mark Antony fell on his sword and was taken to Cleopatra in his final death throes and died in her arms. Her lover was lost. Egypt was lost. She too committed suicide. We don't actually know how Cleopatra died. Roman writers have given us two different versions of how Cleopatra killed herself. Either she ate a poisoned fig from a basket of figs, or she used an asp, a poisonous snake, which would have been a symbol of magic and power in Egyptian religion. Even Cleopatra's suicide seemed an act of defiance. By taking her own life, she prevented Octavian parading her through Rome as a symbol of his triumph. But with Cleopatra's death, the last barrier protecting Egypt was removed. Octavian declared himself the first emperor, Augustus Caesar. The Egyptian people immediately became Roman subjects. After the death of Cleopatra, Egypt became just another province in the Roman Empire albeit a very wealthy and important province. Gradually, over time, Egyptian traditions like the language and religion faded away, and Egypt wouldn't be an independent country again for almost 2,000 years. Cleopatra's defeat and death opened the door for full-scale Roman occupation of Egypt. But can this be seen as her own personal failing? Many historians argue that without her, Roman domination would have come far sooner. The proof she frustrated the Romans lies in the fact that they tried to blacken and even erase her name. Setting aside the Roman view of her, the evidence paints a portrait of a unique woman. She presided over one of the greatest cities in antiquity and left her mark at some of the most beautiful temples. For two decades, she protected her country from the world's first superpower. She simply couldn't stem the tide of history. The story of Cleopatra is the twilight of Egyptian civilization as we know it. Uh, we looked at Egyptian civilization from the pyramids through Tutankhamun, through Alexander the Great, and with her death, pharaonic civilization ceases because the next ruler, Augustus, is an absentee landlord and there is no monarch present in Egypt. She is the last page of the last chapter of the glory that was Egypt. View at a time that suits you, Secrets of Egypt is also available on demand five. And stay with us next for the last in the series of dangerous adventures for boys with Olympic sprinter Darren Campbell and son Aaron forming a crack racing team.